point. It's just a general questionnaire. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, we're live. Take it away, Krishna. Okay. So. Let me just mute this. Sure, so welcome everyone. Uh, we're excited to have Valentin Perchokin with us today. He's gonna to be talking about representing rotation in deep learning. Uh, I've known Valentin like from a couple of workshops uh, at RSS earlier this year, and then we've had an interesting chat you know, today. But just to uh, introduce him briefly, he's a postdoc with uh, Nicholas Roy at the Robust Robotics Group at CCL MIT. And uh, most of the work that he's done is at the intersection of classical geometric uh, methods in robotics and how they gel with deep learning. And he's gonna be talking about some of his recent work. Uh, and this also won the best paper award at RSS earlier this year. So yeah, uh, really looking forward to hearing him talk. Take it away, Valentin. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Krishna. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Valentin Paratrukin. I'm a postdoc at MIT, and uh, I'll be talking to you today about representing rotation in deep learning. Uh, the first thing I thought I would do is kind of just give you a background of um, uh, my educational background. Uh, so I started, uh, my undergrad at the University of Toronto in 2008 and graduated in 2013 in engineering science, uh, majoring in aerospace. And then uh, seven years later, this past March, I defended my PhD thesis entitled Learned Improvements to the Visual Ego Motion Pipeline. And I was supervised by Professor Jonathan Kelly and advised uh, by Professor Angela Scholick and Tim Barfoot. And I know Angela will also be a speaker in the series. So it's a, it's a real honor to be uh, included in the list, uh, invited uh, to a list of such uh, accomplished speakers. Um, and then finally, after a bunch of delays uh, due to COVID, uh, I moved to Cambridge this past August and began a postdoc at MIT with Professor Nicholas Roy, as Krishna uh, introduced me. Now, a few other things about me. Um, during my undergrad, I did a 16-month uh, co-op at the Canadian Space Agency in Montreal. So I actually uh, lived in Montreal close to UDM, uh, maybe in the vicinity of where some of you are now. And uh, I worked at the Canadian Space Agency in, in, on the south shore at, at Saint Hubert. Um, I was also uh, really lucky uh, to find the time and the money to uh, complete my private pilot's license during my PhD, during over two summers of my PhD. I've always been into general aviation, and this is a real, uh, I guess, thrill for me to be able to, to accomplish that. And uh, as Krista mentioned, um, I've, I've met him at several workshops, but uh, two I want to mention here, uh, I've helped organize the debates on the future of robotics research uh, at ICRA these past two years. And this year, one of my co-organizers was uh, Professor Florian Schkerti, who I know was the first speaker in the series. So lots of connections. And then finally, um, I've also uh, been a pioneer, an RSS pioneer, and also an organizer of the RSS Pioneers Workshop. And um, I got to know Krishna uh, uh, very well through this this year, and uh, he'll be part of the organizing committee next year. So, um, the agenda for this afternoon includes three parts. Um, first, I'm gonna tell you a bit about uh, how I came to care about learning rotations through my doctoral work. Um, then I'll back up and discuss some nitty gritty details about rotations and uh, what's important to keep in mind when incorporating them into uh, deep networks. And then finally, I'll end uh, with some specifics about this recent uh, paper that uh, Krishna mentioned uh, that was published at RSS 2020 on the new representation of uh, rotations that's particularly suited to deep learning. So let's begin. Um, so my journey to SO3. So uh, my doctoral work was driven uh, by really this dichotomy that emerged in robotics literature. It's, it's been there, I think, uh, for a long time, but really in the last five years, it's become more salient. And that's the dichotomy between data-driven and model-driven techniques. And the former are often motivated by a sense that the real world, is complex and difficult to understand with analytic tools. Uh, 
So as uh, Cormac McCarthy, the American author, writes in one of my favorite books, uh, Blood Meridian, in this world, more things exist without our knowledge than with it. And the order in creation which you see is that which you have put there, like a string in a maze. Yet, um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that uh, the history of science and philosophy is rife with examples where an Occam's razor cuts through the complexity of the world and reveals some uh, often elegant mathematical foundations. So as the Nobel laureate physicist Eugene Wigner writes in a, in a quite famous paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. And so in my doctoral work, I tried to kind of merge these two perspectives, not uh, throw out this gift that uh, we don't understand, but also to um, respect the complexity of the world. So namely, um, I did this while focusing on a particular pipeline that's it's common in, in mobile robotics, and that's the visual ego motion pipeline or visual odometry that's central to many uh, vision-based localization frameworks, and I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. So just really briefly, most of these types of pipelines uh, can classically consist of um, three blocks. So you might have a pre-processing block that may apply some calibration, undistort images, things like that. Um, then there's a data association block that um, can take in either direct or indirect um, uh, features, can apply some outlier rejection. And then uh, using that data association, you can apply uh, robust nonlinear least squares or some sort of filtering approach to get you an emotion estimate. Um, this is also where you can add additional sensors with appropriate probabilistic modeling. Now, classical ego motion pipelines have several potential downsides, which I'm sure I don't need to um, tell many of you, but I will list three of them here. So they may assume idealized noise models based on isotropic homoscedastic uncertainty. Um, they may discard significant portions of rich visual data. Even if they're dense techniques, they usually focus on regions, uh, image regions of high gradients. And also they're, they're often prone to bias, to systematic bias um, due to imprecise calibration or uh, first order uncertainty propagation. And so in light of these deleterious aspects, the mobile autonomy literature of the last several years has often turned to, uh, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware from the title of this talk, uh, replacing this uh, data-driven, uh, excuse me, replacing this type of pipeline with uh, what's sometimes called the big kahuna network, right? Or some large learned method that can take in training data and output ego motion. Now, uh, I think, before we go and kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater, it's important to consider some of the benefits of classical pipelines. They're interpretable and decomposable, which improves generalization performance as um, recently written about in a science robotics paper. They're computationally efficient and often can run on low powered embedded systems like those used in space applications. And they are backed up by a large body of probabilistic theory. Finally, even if one cares simply about accuracy, uh, the most accurate visual ego motion technique on the Kitty leaderboard, which I'm sure many of you are also familiar with, to this day remains uh, one that's based on classical modeling with really careful feature selection and one that doesn't use learning. So is there any place for learning uh, in ego motion estimation and state estimation in general, and maybe in robotics in general, uh, well, in my doctoral work, I tried to kind of synthesize these two approaches in three different ways. I looked at uh, improving uncertainty quantification through learning, uh, correcting bias through learning, and extracting useful latent representations to improve robustness and accuracy through learning. And often I would call these things uh, learned pseudosensors in analogy to hardware sensors that we can also add to a classical pipeline. Now today, uh, to motivate the idea of learning rotations, I'll take you through three of these pseudosensors that I worked on, culminating in this final learned rotation sensor. Uh, so these will be really brief tours, just to keep in mind the time. But we'll, we'll start with this approach called SunBCNN. And here with uh, SunBCNN, we, we pose the question, can we leverage the tools of uh, deep convolutional neural networks uh, at the time, which is about 2015, 2016, uh, to extract the illumination direction of the sun with a consistent notion of uncertainty from a single RGB image. 
And we showed through a few papers that this is indeed possible using an approach called Bayesian convolutional neural networks or BCNNs, which use something called Monte Carlo dropout. And our, our learned pseudosensor Sun BCN uh, was fused with visual ego motion estimates to inject global orientation information and reduce drift without any additional hardware sensors. And the analogy was uh, of this software based sun sensor was to hardware based sun sensors that are found in various planetary rovers. And also, um, actually, this wasn't obvious to us about um, different sun compasses that are conjectured to exist in, in animals large and small. So for example, these uh, sand hoppers, the crustaceans, and they seem to use the sun um, direction of the sun combined with an internal clock as an aid in navigating back home. And so skipping over a lot of the details, um, here's just a video of this type of technique working on one of the kitty uh, sequences. And here we don't perform, uh, it's important to note that uh, when you look at these types of uh, predictions, uh, hopefully the, the video is relatively smooth in your feed, but um, you do see that um, there's sometimes certain jumping that occurs in these predictions, but we showed that because we can quantify a decent notion of uncertainty, um, incorporating these uh, into a visual eagle motion pipeline still greatly reduces uh, long-term drift because we have this covariance that can then uh, tell us when, when our uh, estimates are, uh, potentially have higher error. Um, and here, here's uh, again some BCNN running on images collected on a planetary analog site on Devon Island in the Canadian High Arctic. And here the scenery is, is quite regular compared to the urban environment of Kitty. Um, and therefore we can achieve even more accurate sun tracking, which allows us to derive uh, error corrections that rival those from a hardware-based sun sensor, which this data set uh, contains. If you do have any questions, uh, uh, please feel free to interrupt me as well and just ask any specifics. I know I'm going through a lot of these things pretty quickly. So I, I guess there's a question from the chat. Yep. Uh, sorry, I don't. Uh, can you read it out, uh, Krishna? Uh, uh, I'm going to speak the question. Oh, uh, yeah. Hello. I'm, uh, I'm a master's student under Liam. So uh, my question is, if I understood right from the Sun BCNN, is it that you predict the, the, uh, the, the direction of the sun through the neural network and you use uh, MC dropout to, uh, uh, to estimate the uncertainty? Is that right? That's correct, yeah. OK, so in this, like, uh, how do you, uh, like, on what relative the position of sun is. Like I see that in the video, like the vector is from the plane. So is it like the direction of the sun from the plane or is it relative to the vehicle? Because it's in the, it's in the camera frame. So we extract it in the camera frame and then we need to do, we need to be careful about how we compute our visual odometry because we, in order, uh, just knowing where the sun is, is not enough. You also need a prediction of where the sun should be. And so what we use an initial starting spot our GPS at the very beginning, um, plus a, a timestamp in order to um, get a, an ephemeris model for the sun. And then that tells us where we expect the sun to be given our post prediction. And we compare that to uh, the estimate given uh, to us by Sun BCNN and use that in, in, uh, to help us with ego motion. So there's another question in chat from David Kruger. Uh, a clarification regarding the two arrows that we see in the video. Yes. So one of the errors is ground truth. So we have accurate uh, GPS poses there. And so we know where the sun uh, should be very accurately. And so that's just a, a visualization to, to aid us. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the second learning approach I'll tell you about is called DPC net. And uh, again, I apologize that I'm not, I'm not giving too many details about these talks, but hopefully uh, you, you know, I might inspire you to read the papers if, if they seem intriguing. Um, and this is uh, called deep pose correction. Um, and this attempts to generalize the implicit global rotation information that was extracted using Sun BCNN to more general six degree freedom uh, pose corrections. So I'll tell you about that now. And so here um, we set out to learn pose residuals based on supervised training data collected using ground truth. So if we have um, uh, ground truth poses, which for the kitty data set, for instance, we do. Um, and there's some uh, visual dometry estimate. We're looking for this residual here, this target correction. 
And the question is, what can we uh, correct for? Well, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we can correct for things like estimator biases due to stereo triangulation. So stereo cameras are, are known uh, to have non-Gaussian uh, errors um, the further away you get from your camera. And depending on how uh, wide your baseline is, those errors can be uh, larger or smaller. And other things we can correct for are miscalibrations. So getting accurate calibrations, especially on terrain that may be wobbly is often difficult. Uh, it, can, it can dislodge certain sensors and create um, poor extrinsic calibration. Um, and also the feature distribution is often important. You wanna have, uh, if, if you're looking at a sparse approach, you wanna have features that uh, generally cover your image space in order to get a, a good state estimate. And sometimes these can be uh, biased. Uh, certain regions of the image uh, could produce more features and therefore result in a biased uh, pose estimate. Um, I do also wanna mention that uh, this, uh, there's other works in robotics that looks, look at pose residuals. Uh, so for instance, this is uh, some work out of Dieter Fox's group in, in 2018 on deep iterative matching for object uh, pose regression. And this paper, which is one of my favorite, I think, robotics papers of the last uh, 10 years. If you've never seen these videos, it's just incredibly well done paper. Um, and this is uh, called Tossing Bot. We get one best systems paper at RSS last year. And uh, here there's this concept introduced of residual physics, which are learned for improving tossing accuracy and using arbitrary grips. And it's also just really cool to see two, uh, two robots playing uh, catch like that. Nevertheless, in, in this DPC work, um, what we did was we designed a convolutional network that uh, takes in as input two sets of stereo image pairs and outputs a six dimensional pose vector that represents a pose correction for a fixed VO pipeline. And as part of this, this was a, there was a Lee theoretic uh, loss function that we derived that I'm not gonna go into here, but the, the gist of this is that we're correcting poses. And by fusing this, um, these types of pose corrections with a given fast computationally efficient frame to frame stereo VO method, we can then create really state of the art uh, accuracies for localization that rival uh, much more computationally expensive uh, windowed approaches using uh, dense uh, direct uh, slam and, and the like. Now, throughout this residual learning, uh, we noticed something interesting and that's, I'm just pointing out right here. And so if, if we decompose the full pose corrections into residuals over uh, only rotation or even over only yaw, we saw that we could actually generalize it in many cases, these types of corrections better and they produce better results than the full pose residuals. And um, one of the conjectures we had was that because translations, if you're learning over stereo require metric information, this becomes more difficult to generalize uh, than uh, the compact rotation group. Um, and so this combined with the results of Sun BCNN led me to look closer at learning rotations with uncertainty through uh, a multi-headed network structure I called HydroNet. Um, but I don't wanna move too fast. So before I tell you about that work, I wanna take a step back and summarize uh, just a few reasons why you might be interested in learning rotations and discuss some salient properties of the rotation group. Liam, do you have a question? You look... Uh... Yeah, so I, I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that everybody understands what you're talking about. So can you, you've alluded to this a few times, the uh, what you mean by dense uh, versus sparse visual odometry, just for anybody who's not already yes, aware. What of course, is. yeah. So I think dense and sparse is actually kind of a misnomer. I like to think of it as direct versus indirect. So right. in direct methods, which are generally dense, what you're doing is you're comparing photometric intensities, which means you're matching pixel intensities to other pixel intensities. Um, and those can actually be relatively sparse approaches because you're not looking at the entire image but often I just refer to them as dense methods. Whereas uh, in indirect methods, you're extracting point features and then matching those, um, and those are generally sparse. So there's kind of two separate ways you can associate data between two images that at the end of the day, what you're looking for is, is the transform, the relative transform between the two, but there's different ways that you can extract a data association. So uh, in the last work, uh, you, you argued that the, the work is as good as a direct method, uh, but saves in terms of resource consumption 
or yeah. the that, yeah that was the claim right so how did you you evaluate that in terms of like like looking at like cpu usage or latency or those kind of metrics yeah we evaluated it by hand waving away <laughs> the, the evaluation <laughs> um no so so the network i mean i can say that if you, we had a number of questions about this because obviously i mean if you need a, a a network, a convolutional network, in what sense are you more efficient because you might need a GPU, things like that. Um, but really this was a, the DPC framework was quite, the actual network was quite small. Um, and so uh, I, the, the way I would answer your question is that I don't wanna get into the specifics of you know how many, how many flops do we need for each method, right. but really that you can do um, with the same images, um, there's different ways to achieve the same accuracy. And depending on what you're looking for, um, maybe this type of learned residual approach is more useful because you can turn it off, right? Whereas uh, with a, um, a more computationally expensive, like windowed uh, keyframe approach, that's, you're kind of committed to that once you go. I mean, there's various parameters that you can change, of course. But so this gives you, might give you a bit more flexibility as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. No problem. Um, all right. So let me just summarize. Uh, why, why rotations really? Why um, reasons to learn rotations? Even if you don't care about rotations per se, you don't want to replace uh, some classical rotation estimator. Um, you might want to learn them because there are many latent absolute rotation cues that exist in images. So if you think about um, in Toronto, uh, where I've lived up until recently, there's the CN Tower. And so uh, whenever you're walking around, often a really good way to orient yourself downtown if you're kind of lost, is just to look for the tower. And that immediately tells you that's south, unless, you're, unless you see water, then you're probably south of the sea and tower. But for the most part, that, that kind of gives you this really nice directional cue that that's south. And similar, of course, um, there are stars and, and the sun that can and do something similar. Um, second of all, relative rotation learning requires only image pairs. And what I mean by that is it doesn't require stereo information and it doesn't require depth information. You can just match uh, pixels and then back out a rotation out of that. And that uh, can help you create a more simpler, a simpler network architecture. Two, uh, and this is we saw with some BCNN and there's some prior work by Ed Olson and other people to show that uh, debt reckoning techniques such as VO uh, are particularly sensitive to errors in rotation. So if you can correct rotation, you can reduce uh, super linear error growth to linear growth. Um, there's also been work by Luca Carlone and, and others to show that SLAM and various PoseGraph optimization techniques are, are sensitive to rotation initialization. And so if we can use learning to improve that initialization, that would be really helpful. And then finally, um, this is a more subtle point, but rotations form a compact which means a bounded and closed group. And this I think is particularly useful for deep learning in a way that I'll describe uh, in a bit. However, uh, okay, so we, we're gonna learn rotations. What do we need uh, to do that? Well, a couple of questions you might ask. Uh, which representation do we use? Which loss function is most appropriate? And how do you deal with uncertainty? And so uh, in order to address these questions, I, I wanna dive headfirst into a number of technical details about rotations. Um, this will be a bit low level, but I find a lot of this uh, quite fascinating and beautiful. And so hopefully I wanna convince you that there's a lot of richness to this, which I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with some of this, but maybe not all. So let's talk about rotations. So uh, rigid body rotations. So if we got this uh, robot, we rotate him around. They, this rigid body rotation is a group of transforms on 3D space that preserves three things. It preserves the origin, it preserves Euclidean distances, and it preserves orientation or handedness. And these rotations can be formalized using something called the special orthogonal matrix Lie group, SO3. And almost every single one of those words there is, is quite important. But um, if I had to summarize it, I would say that rotations do not form a vector space, which means we have to be really careful when uh, we deal with them because they, we, we can't simply uh, treat them as, as any other set of numbers. And I think this really constitutes their aesthetic beauty and their really applications to so many different parts of physics and engineering and quantum mechanics um, and a lot of other places. Uh, but also it's, it's just practically really inconvenient sometimes. And so it's useful to, to have a clear understanding of what this means. So 
uh, like I said, the, these rotations don't form uh, a vector space, but because they are a Lie group, which means that they're also differentiable manifold, which means that they look locally Euclidean. So locally in some region, it kind of looks like rotations uh, form just simple vectors. And indeed there's a special uh, tangent space, what's called a tangent space of this uh, rotation group um, at the identity element, which forms uh, something called the Lie algebra. And this Lie algebra is really useful because it can describe many properties of the group itself. And we can move back and forth between the group and this tangent space using two operations called the exponential and the logarithmic map, which uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of. But importantly, these two operations are not bijective, which means we can't go one-to-one -one between um, two elements. And this is one of the fundamental reasons why we're, uh, working with rotations is sometimes difficult. So um, there are many ways to parameterize or chart uh, rotations apart from rotation matrices themselves. I wanna focus on three here that I think are especially useful in a robot learning context. So first axis angle parameters. Uh, these decompose all rotations into an axis that remains invariant under a rotation and a rotation angle about that axis. And this is possible to do due to like a really beautiful result called Euler's rotation theorem that states that this is possible for an arbitrary rotation. And these can be mapped to rotation matrix using this Rodriguez uh, uh, formula, rotation formula, which is intimately connected to the exponential map. And sometimes you'll see these uh, coordinates called the exponential coordinates of rotation because of this connection to the exponential map. Uh, the second one is probably familiar to everybody who's, who's watching this talk and that's Euler angles, um, which uh, decompose the three D rotation to a sequence of one parameter principal rotations about a carefully selected set of axes. And then finally, we have unicoternions, uh, which have a rich and interesting history. Uh, they're more familiar typically with the computer vision uh, field, less familiar to people who uh, originate from robotics, but these uh, are also uh, can represent rotations. Uh, they're also sometimes called the Euler Rodriguez parameters in a very confusing sort of set of history and uh, sometimes versors in physics, if you're familiar um, with some uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, so what these are, are unit vectors in the space, in the four dimensional space. Now, so those are three parameters and each one of them has some sort of downside. Every representation of rotation, unfortunately has some practical inconvenience. So uh, for three parameter uh, representations like axis angles or other angles, there's no way to represent rotations uh, globally and uniquely. So for instance, for this axis angle parameterization, um, everything's great. We have a one-to-one -one mapping, except for rotations by pi. So you imagine a rotation that completely flips you around. What happens there is that we have this double cover that starts happening where two different parameter sets, phi and negative phi, map to the same rotation. And that screws up the topology and makes things much more difficult. Uh, in Euler angles, you have a, a similar effect, which I'm sure everyone's also familiar with, uh, or at least heard the term gimbal lock, which is where you get into a particular family of rotations that can be represented by an infinite set of Euler angles. And finally, uh, for unicoternions, which are a four parameter set, we have to ensure that um, we take into account this double cover effect, which means that a, a quaternion, a unicoternion and its negative represent the same rotation. Those rotations are identified and this makes the topology also uh, non-trivial. Okay, that's a lot of stuff to take in. Um, maybe I can take, if anyone has any specific questions, I can answer them, but I don't wanna to spend too many, you know, we can obviously spend an hour just discussing these, uh, these different representations. Does anyone have any quick questions about this? Okay, great. Hopefully this is maybe not new. Um, so then we can just move forward. This, this might be a little new, at least it was to me when I started reading about this, is that there's different ways to uh, represent rotation uh, distances between two elements. And there are different, which is sometimes called a distance metric. And the types of distance metrics that are useful are called bi-invariant metrics, which means that they will be invariant no matter which part of SO3 you are on. So that if you have two elements and you multiply them on the left or right side, hence the bi, um, they will be, that distance will be invariant, even if you shift it on that SO3 manifold. So the first really useful bi-invariant metric of SO3, uh, it's called the angular metric. And this is the angle of the axis angle representation. And uh, for some uh, historical reasons and outside the scope of this talk, it's also half the angle between 
uh, or excuse me, twice the angle between two unicoternions. Second, we have the chordal metric, um, which is just uh, the difference uh, is, is the um, distance between the two rotation matrices if they're embedded, unwrapped into nine vectors and embedded into R9. And then finally, uh, we have the quaternionic metric, which is the Euclidean distance between two unicoternions accounting for this double cover, which is why you have this minimum operation. Um, and so all three of these metrics are useful in different contexts. The angular metric is maybe the most natural metric to think about rotations, the distances between rotations. Chordal metrices uh, or metrics have been shown to be useful in initialization rotations, initializing rotations. And the quaternionic metric is useful for rotation averaging, which I'll show you uh, uh, in a second. Another important point to keep in mind is that there are other uh, distances you could write down. For instance, the difference between two uh, axis angle uh, vectors, but they are not often not bi-invariant. And so unless you know what you're doing specifically, you know, you might have small rotations, you have to be really careful when you're writing down loss functions. And that's kind of the, the point of this slide is just be careful when you're choosing a loss function. Okay, finally, there are two general strategies for also keeping track of uncertainty over SO3. We can take a local approach and uh, retract a Gaussian density in the tangent space of some mean element. And this can often be computationally tractable. It's often done for noise propagation from nonlinear optimization. However, it has a significant downside that the density must be concentrated so that we don't wrap around on the manifold. And this means that it's difficult to deal with large uncertainties in stuff like po object pose regression, let's say. And then, conversely, we can take a global approach and use a global density over SO3. And there are a number of ways you can do this. One of them is, is called the Bingham density, which is actually the density over this antipodal, this symmetric sphere. Um, and here, this is, we can deal with large uncertainties, but um, the normalization constant, N, is often difficult to compute. And we have to use something like a lookup table um, and it becomes more difficult to incorporate this into learning. Furthermore, when we think about a consistent rotation estimator, it's useful to consider two sources of uncertainty, aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. So aleatoric is, is some type of sensor noise or some process, uh, some function of the observation process. Whereas epistemic or model uncertainty is loosely speaking, being a result of being far away from training data. So here, for instance, on the left, you see um, a regressor that has good aleatoric uncertainty, but poor epistemic. It's got this kind of jagged epistemic uncertainty that doesn't really grow as we move away from training data. Where something like this, um, we have really pretty good epistemic uncertainty. We have a nice growth here, um, but within the actual training data, um, the uncertainty collapses and we don't account for observation noise. And uh, just to connect this back to neural networks, um, how do you ensure that this type of uncertainty quantification captures both, both sources? For example, um, this MC uh, dropout technique or Monte Carlo sampling based uh, uncertainty, which is connected to variational inference has been shown to poorly capture, uh, capture epistemic uncertainty for certain cases as exemplified in this 1D case here. And there's some other alternatives you can look at in the literature. For instance, um, we can look at learning um, uh, direct covariance uh, through a log likelihood loss. We can apply bootstrap aggregation or bagging through ensemble of learned methods, or which I think is maybe the most elegant approach um, to create this multi-headed structure, which I called hydronet with one body and multiple heads that tries to combine the benefits of both of these uh, techniques. And so with all of that, uh, that leads me to this final, uh, excuse me, leads me to this final um, technique uh, of my doctoral work that I want to quickly tell you about, which is this hydronet approach to learning rotations. And here, um, the main thrust of hydronet is that you capture epistemic uncertainty with variation in the heads, and then use the remainder of this one final head to capture aleatoric uncertainty. And this is all well and good for, for Euclidean targets, but uh, the question is, how do we extend this to rotations? And in order to do this, we'll need to rely on some of that nitty gritty details that I just told you about. And one of the important things, of course, to keep in mind is that to keep all of this differentiable. So we need to compute a rotation average, R bar, and a covariance over these different heads that is differentiable and we can use in our, in our deep learning pipeline. And uh, so to consider how we might do this, 
Um, we need to uh, read a bit about the rotation averages, but it turns out that if we define a rotation average using the quaternionic metric or the quaternion metric, this average is actually a really simple arithmetic mean that's projected back onto uh, or normalized or projected back onto the unit sphere. And this is an operation that's, that's uh, trivially differentiable. And uh, using this mean, we can lift each quaternion of each one of these heads into the tangent space of that mean and then compute an empirical covariance based on that tangent vector space. So we're using this local uncertainty approach. Finally, um, to train each one of our heads, so we're gonna train them independently so we get this variation in them to account for epistemic uncertainty, we need a supervised uh, loss function of some sort and we can use uh, this concentrated Gaussian in the tangent space of some target rotation that looks like this. And then each one of these heads is trained with this log likelihood um, where uh, the likelihood is parameterized by that final head that gives us a notion of aleatoric noise, the stuff that's present even within our training data, even if we're close to training data. Now, to show the importance of both these sources uh, for a consistent estimate, I constructed this synthetic uh, orbital data set where um, there's this absolute rotation regression and you have a training region that's defined by a polar angle. And so within this polar angle, you have a camera that's looking down in a bunch of landmarks, 36 landmarks on the ground. And your training data is only between plus or minus 60 degrees on this polar angle. And as you can see within the uh, training region, uh, this is a way to kind of visualize out of distribution really concretely. Within the training uh, distribution, the aleatoric uh, source of uncertainty, this constant source is enough to account for the simulated noise. Whereas this, as we move outside of that training region, um, this variation in heads starts to grow and grow and grow and we get this epistemic uncertainty that grows as well. And these, this is plotted over three degrees of freedom uh, um, of, of the rotation matrix. Okay, and so in addition to learning uh, absolute orientations, we can take all this and then apply it to improve classical visual ego motion in the same way that we used a DBCNet or some BCNet. But now we treat this as basically an independent or loosely independent, we have to make sure that it's independent, um, sensor of rotation that we can then fuse back into our normal ego motion using uh, more standard techniques like post graph optimization or, or factor graphs um, because each one of these techniques now has some notion of uncertainty. So we can use a classical air propagation on a, on a pipeline and then use this, this um, hydronet uncertainty for our rotations and fuse them that way. So we did exactly this in this work. And whereas the actual rotations, if you just look at the absolute uh, or the, the relative rotations on something like Kitty, um, the accuracy is good, but it's about the same as the classical technique. But if you fuse it with the classical technique, you again get this really nice improvement that uh, is uh, up, up to par with uh, this DPC approach, which was correcting the full pose. Okay, so that was that basically takes you to uh, last January before we submitted the RSS paper. And in the final uh, part of my presentation, I wanna discuss this kind of new representation of SO3 that was a collaboration between uh, my doctoral lab at U of T and, and, and my postdoc lab at MIT. Um, now you might ask, oh my God, another representation? We just had three and it's just too much. Come on, like, move on. Um, point taken. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to bring up this, this um, uh, quote from Simon Altman who wrote a, a book on, on quaternions. And he, has, uh, he says, anyone who has ever used any other parameterization of the rotation group will, within hours of taking up the quaternion of parameterization, lament his or her misspent youth. And for a little bit, I did feel that way when I, when I looked at some of the hydronet stuff. It's like, no, why don't we just use quaternions all the time? And so what's wrong with unicoternions know, in the context of deep learning? Who cares? I'll put four numbers, normalize that. That's a rotation. We got you know, bigger fish to fry. Uh, let's go figure out general AI. Um, well, hold on. Uh, so unicoternions, the way most people use this in deep learning, there's, there's a concrete issue here. And that is that there's a discontinuous right inverse. In other words, there's a discontinuity that occurs when you use unicoternions in this way um, when you try to back propagate. And this will become important when you learn large rotation matrices. And I'll 
I'll tell you about that in a second. And second of all, um, one of the issues we had with HydroNet was really trying to find a, a good notion of epistemic uncertainty. We could show in synthetic examples that this works, but over images, um, it wouldn't work reliably. And so that was something we wanted to fix. And furthermore, um, a major inspiration for this work was a paper published at CDPR um, that discussed the continuity of rotation representations and introduced this idea that unit quaternions are discontinuous in the right inverse. However, they were a point representation. And so this work kind of tries to combine these two um, approaches and tries to um, present a representation that is both continuous and also has this probabilistic interpretation with a useful notion of epistemic uncertainty. So this work uh, is quite a mouthful and it's, the paper is called A Smooth Representation of Belief over SO3 for Deep Rotation Learning with Uncertainty. We debated giving it like a really catchy colon title. Uh, couldn't come up with anything that was too good. So we kept it at, at this long title. But what I wanna do right now is just kind of first set up the representation. And if you're dealing with rotations, I just wanna show you that's pretty simple to implement in your network. And then I'll talk about two properties of, uh, that I mentioned earlier. One that it's smooth, continuous and differentiable, and two, that it represents a belief over SO3. So uh, we developed this representation by considering the WABA problem, uh, which was motivated by reading some of Luca Carloni's work on Quasar, which you may have seen as well. Um, I sometimes refer to this as the Wally problem uh, to remind myself of what we're talking about. Um, but so the WABA problem, uh, which is first formulated by Grace Waba, is in the context of satellite attitude determination where you're trying to find a least squares estimate of the rotation that best aligns two sets of noisy point measurements. And this problem can be really elegantly formulated as a quadratically constrained quadratic program over unicoternions where you have this data matrix A. And to develop our representation, what we asked was, could we generalize this A? You know, this is a data matrix, so why don't we just learn this data matrix? Um, and then use the solution of this uh, QCQP to map uh, onto a uh, unique SO3 element. And the way this works in practice is that this QCQP um, actually admits a closed form solution via eigen decomposition. We didn't know this originally. And when we were developing this work, we first started with some differentiable convex optimization work. Um, uh, you may be familiar with some of that from uh, um, Zico Coulter's work at CMU. We started with that and we had a much more complicated expression and then realized that this actually has a very analytic expression um, that we can um, differentiate through. And so, oops, uh, let's go forward here. Yep, so, so the solution is given by the minimum eigenspace and then the derivative is given by the implicit function theorem but has a really nice analytic uh, expression as uh, I mentioned here. And uh, crucially, the thing to keep in mind here is that when we solve this type of problem, we don't um, as the output, we don't receive a single unit quaternion. What we do, what we receive is the minimal eigenspace of the symmetric matrix A. And that minimal eigenspace includes these two antipodal uh, unit quaternions. And this respects the double cover of S3 over SO3 and leads to a smooth representation. Now, if that's all gibberish, uh, which I understand if it might be, um, the, the thing to take away from this slide is that this is actually really simple to implement in both PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, this is already implemented in the background for a function like SIMIG. So all you need to do is, is formulate a symmetric matrix, apply SIMIG, and um, extract the relevant eigenspace. What's the minimum eigenspace? So the minimum eigenspace is the eigenspace that uh, corresponds to the minimum eigenvalue. Thank you for that question. So it's, it's the eigenvector family, the line of eigenvectors that corresponds to the minimal eigenvalue. Yep. Um, so you'll have four eigenvalues for a real symmetric matrix and you arrange them in order and, and then choose the minimal eigenvector. And, and by default, actually PyTorch and I believe also TensorFlow arranges them that way anyways, uh, because of some backend uh, routines. So it's quite simple to do. Um, so, so just to give you a, like a very concrete a comparison between what, if you're dealing with rotations now, you might be outputting uh, four numbers, normalizing them and interpreting them as unit quaternions. Uh, in order to change over to our representation, all you need to do is change that final linear layer, output 10 numbers, rearrange them into a, a symmetric matrix, and then call SIMIG on that, and then that will get you a, rot a unit quaternion uh, rotation. Okay, so 
that's all well and good, but what, why, should, why should we do this, right? Why, why should you remove something as simple as just normalizing four numbers and, and change over to this representation? Well, first of all, um, it's, it's smooth. And so what I mean by this is um, in reference to the smoothness defined by the CDPR paper uh, by Zhu et al, uh, which show that the mapping G, which is called a section or a right inverse, from the group SO3 into another representation is really important for learning. Namely, if that mapping is uh, continuous, then this facilitates the learning of arbitrarily large rotation targets. And in our paper, what we do is we actually construct, um, so it's a proof by construction, we construct a smooth uh, section of our representation and show that it exists. And another more um, interesting general fact, is that SO3, you can use topology, topological arguments, and which is what Zhu et al. do, um, to say that SO3 can be embedded into Euclidean space RD with Euclidean topology only when D is less, uh, greater than or equal to five. And so there's no way to do that in a four-dimensional space like Unicoternians. And our, our representation is 10-dimensional. It's got even more parameters. So why would we want those parameters? Well, I'll tell you about it in a second, but first uh, let me just discuss uh, this continuity and why this matters. So one of the things we did excuse me, uh, is uh, train a network with three different parameterizations and show uh, whether or not this continuity matters. And what we found is that our representation shown here in blue uh, performs comparably to the continuous representation, which was uh, proposed by Jural in red and significantly outperforms the uh, quaternion formulation and this is especially true when you include rotations with magnitudes close to 180 degrees in the training and test data. So basically they're about equal um, for arbitrary rotations, but once you start to get to really the, the source of this discontinuity, um, you really have to be careful and choose a smooth representation. Okay, so that's smoothness. Now, what we have 10 parameters here. So could our representation be encoding something else? And this is sort of a, a somewhat serendipitous discovery that we made. Um, it wasn't something that we set out to do at the beginning, but I wanna uh, point your attention towards the Bingham density, which I brought up earlier. And this is an antipodally symmetric probability density on the unit sphere in any dimension, but we can take it to be in, in R4 um, to be over unicoternions. And this density is defined using a diagonal matrix of what's called dispersion coefficients, lambdas, um, and an orthogonal matrix that defines the mode and principal uncertainty axes. And what you can show is that any symmetric matrix, which our uh, representation is one of, um, can be mapped uniquely to a Bingham distribution over the three-dimensional unicoternion sphere. And so what this allows us to do is to treat our representation as a belief um, over Bingham's, uh, over a, a belief of a, of a Bingham density over SO3. Now, what can we do with this? So, well, we could, for instance, um, try to apply a, a likelihood loss to this. And uh, this is actually done by some work at, at iClear this year in 2020, um, uh, where Igor Glachansky, who was at MIT and now is, I think, just accepted a position at UFT, um, looked at uh, uh, basically learning uh, rotational uncertainty through Bingham losses like this. However, the problem here is that, as I mentioned earlier, this normalization constant is difficult to compute. And in Igor's work, um, they used a lookup table, which we wanted to avoid. And so instead, we just used a simple quartal based loss based off uh, one of the binary metrics that I told you about earlier, which has no notion of, of uh, uncertainty here or dispersion. It's just simply uh, looking at the ground truth and comparing distances. However, what we show empirically is that we can still extract a useful notion of epistemic uncertainty from the spectrum of A. And we call this technique dispersion thresholding because we define this coefficient that we can then threshold and use as a notion of epistemic uncertainty. So I'll show you how this works. So again, we use the trusty kitty. Um, and so we, we try and detect and reject out of distribution, uh, training distribution samples at test time. What we do is we look at our training data and compute quantiles of this dispersion coefficient, and then just set a threshold at Q equals 0.75. So the, the three quarters quantile here, uh, or the third quantile, excuse me. Uh, 
And what we can do is using that, we can threshold the test data and we show the power of this technique by actually uh, artificially corrupting the test data without augmenting the training data. So the model knows nothing about these corruptions, but can using this type of uh, thresholding can reject um, out of training distribution uh, uh, samples. And to give you a bit more um, in numerical results, and we compared this to uh, a technique you may be familiar with uh, where you do anomaly detection using an autoencoder. And we show that our approach, which doesn't require a separate model, can do much better than an autoencoder uh, on Kitty and actually has, um, if, if we control for the, the images that are uh, corrupted or not, we can show that we reject them with 97% precision and maintain high accuracy uh, despite uh, this corruption. So of course, we're not computing uh, rotations because we're rejecting these uh, samples. But I think in, in some sense, that might be the best thing to do. If you have a learned technique, what you'd like to do is just reject them and say, I can't do anything with this, um, do something else or move on to some other set of inputs. Um, and we, we showed this not only just on Kitty, but also on this, um, out of, uh, this MAV data set where we partition the data into outdoor, indoor, and transition data. We showed that we could uh, uh, use this dispersion thresholding to reject uh, images that look different from our training data and basically maintain a similar accuracy across uh, different training uh, test sets, excuse me, that include novel images that, of a type that we haven't seen during training. Okay, um, now why I, I wanted to put this in, this is a conjecture that we put in the paper. And why does dispersion thresholding work without a, a Bingham loss? So, so I, I wanna reiterate that all of this is just purely a function of the eigenvalues of the symmetric matrix, learned symmetric matrix A that we learn. Um, and it doesn't require any particular loss to work. And so um, in order to explain this in the paper, we link um, this minimization, uh, this QCQP to a rotation averaging operation. So we, I talked about rotation averaging using quaternion metrics. If you use the quartal metric, the rotation average, averaging actually uses the same type of minimum eigenspace operation, except it's actually a maximal eigenspace operation, which is why you see a negative here. But effectively you can average a bunch of uh, rotations by converting them into unit quaternions forming their outer product, and then performing an operation that's very similar to what we perform um, in our rotation representation. And so what we did was we said, okay, this is a very peculiar connection. There must be something more that we can say about this. And so we looked at some prior work here uh, uh, from CVPR also 2019, where some authors suggested that maybe what CNN-based pose regression does is learn a set of bases, which it interpolates over. And we can make this more concrete in our case and draw a really nice parallel. So if we consider our network without the last layer that outputs some uh, uh, numbers gamma, and then we look at our last layer that's parameterized, this linear layer that's parameterized by W and B, some weight and some bias as, as usual. What we can show if we work through the math is that effectively our final symmetric matrix is a composition of these base A's, these base rotations. And the entire thing, once we apply F to this, this minimization, it, it becomes analogous to a weighted rotation average using the quartal metric over a learned basis. So what you're really doing is through this type of rotation learning, it's a compact space and you're learning these, uh, these bases, which then you interpolate over at test time. And the conjecture we have in the paper is that the reason why this dispersion thresholding works uh, without an explicit likelihood loss is because in training, uh, in training distribution samples are more likely to be closer to these base rotations and therefore have lower dispersion. Uh, we haven't verified this, but this is part of the, the future work of this, uh, of this approach. Um, okay, so I just have a few more. I know there's a lot of technical stuff to take in. I'm sorry, but I really wanted to share uh, kind of try to weave the story of, of my, my, my PhD and as well as, as this, this RSS work. So I just wanted to summarize a few things. I mean, of course, the lesson is that um, uh, as always, you just have to be careful when you, when you choose a uh, thing, when you're modeling, you have to choose appropriate things, uh, appropriate mathematical tools to model certain quantities and SO3 is no different. So be very careful when you choose your representation and the type of metric that you use for your loss function. 
uh, some recommendations so that um, hopefully this is, you know, if you don't care about this at all, but you might have to use a rotation uh, in uh, some learning context, I would recommend using unicoternians so you don't lament your misspent youth um, unless you have large rotations present. So things like object pose regression where you might want to regress a rotation that's completely you know, 180 degrees relative to some identity element then that's where it's important to use a continuous representation. And I would suggest, uh, if I may, to try out our representation, which is pretty simple to, to use. Um, also, if you're gonna use the loss function, make sure to use one of the three bi-invariant metrics, at least as a starting point. And then you can think about maybe some other metric that makes sense. And then finally, if you're gonna uh, deal with uncertainty, of course, it's really useful to consider both these aleatoric and epistemic sources. Uh, super briefly at the end, also the future work, um, this rotation basis conjecture we're really interested in pursuing further. Um, there's some nice uh, ways you can extend some of this to compact poses where you have a limit to your, your translational component. Um, and also uh, we're hoping to build out uh, a library. Uh, Krishna was telling me that uh, him and, and, and other collaborators were working on a, a differentiable slam library. Um, I'm trying to put together also this kind of general rotation library that people can use. Okay, and then also if you're just starting out as a, as a, as a student maybe, or you're just curious about some of this uh, rotation stuff, uh, maybe I can suggest three, pieces, three papers that I think are really useful to read and understand. I always go back to these. I went back to these when I was putting together these slides. One is Rotation Averaging by Hartley et al. And this is a paper from IJCD from 2013. There's another, um, uh, paper by uh, Yuan Sola uh, called the Micro Lee Theory for State Estimation and Robotics. And this kind of condenses a lot of these exponential maps, logarithmic maps, unicoternians, um, and general Lee theoretic concepts into 20 pages. It's constantly being updated. It's a wonderful resource. If you don't know about it, you should definitely check it out. And finally, um, a, an older paper uh, by uh, the same author, Altman, that details the history of unit quaternions and quaternions in general, Hamilton Rodriguez, and this kind of scandal that happened um, uh, between a misrepresentation or misunderstanding uh, that Hamilton had of what quaternions really are. And one, I uh, just want to share a cool little tidbit, I think it's cool, that uh, learned through this paper. And that is that the modern cross product and dot product were first defined in the context of quaternion products. These days, it kind of seems backwards because almost always we learn, you know, cross products and dot products first in terms of three-dimensional vectors, and then we talk about unicoternions, you know, if at all. But uh, historically, that was actually the, the reverse. So, uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention, and uh, I'd love to take any uh, remaining questions you may have. And. These are some of my collaborators. So this is the STARS lab uh, at UFT. Thank you, Liam, uh, for that little clap. And uh, I've just linked this GitHub repo for our representation. But of course, you can just uh, Google that. Hopefully, you could be able to find it. And uh, send me an email if you have any specific questions as well that you want to raise now. OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. I guess we have quite a few questions. Uh, Maybe we could end the live stream. There don't seem to be a lot of questions on the YouTube end, so that people I scared can away interact the more freely. Yeah. <laughs> they saw the exponential map and they said, "I'm going to go watch KC."